to these presentations. And now we're going to give the floor to Jose de Pablo, who is going to be talking to us uh, about the experience of the exercises as a community subject. He is a Jesuit. He works in the Salamanca uh, and Manresa Spirituality Centers. And he's part of the Christian Life Community Organization. He's worked on the pastoral and he has a lot of experience on education and also something very important as to the presentation that we're going to be listening to now is to say that he is a member of the International Association of Spiritual Exercises for the Apostolic Common Discernment. And from there, he's accompanied discernment work in different countries. Yes, and I'm number four speaker. So I guess the first thing we should do is stand up, stand up, everybody, please stretch out arms, look at the people around you. Please, let's all do that. It's the best thing we can do. Come on, just stand up, stretch your legs, stretch your arms, have a look at those around you. Very good. Say hi to some people you didn't get the chance to say hi to. Greet the people you've not greeted. Very good. Very good. Thank you so much. This is the best minute of my presentation, believe me. Because as we're going to be talking about the experience of the exercises with the community commune subject, we are more now a community subject, aren't we? Well, what I wanted to do today is very simply Mm, talk about three axes. One is the basic convictions. What are our convictions in order to talk about an experience of the exercises with a community service? Then we look or go along a historical mm, overview, although in, you'll have all that uh, written out in the final document that will be uploaded. But here I'll try just and give you a summary of the historical parkour. And then uh, before we go into the concrete method of the exercises for a community subject, I'm going to do what typically is done in websites, yeah, which is to answer the um, frequently asked questions. Yes, FAQS. And all the time I've been working on spiritual exercises for groups or for what we might call a corporate or community subject. Yes, many questions come up. And, try, and I'll try and answer these questions, giving you the specific example of the Buenos Aires experience not long ago. So if I have time, I'll get to that too. First thing to think about is whether the spiritual exercises are useful. And as I said, to take away those untidy or messy affections. And then once these are out to look for the divine will, in each one, if this is done individually, why couldn't this not be done by a corporate persona to understand that what goes on in a person can go on in a group? Because the group has also been created to, to serve God our Father. And what happened here 500 years ago was a personal experience of Saint Ignatius is something that can also be a group experience. It can also be something that moves everyone if we focus on two initial convictions. The first one, that God guides his people from Exodus, from the time of creation, from any movement happening, God is guiding his people, each and every person. And God's people, uh, well, has been created to revere and serve God our Lord. And such people then, the conviction is that the Holy Ghost is acting on each and every one of the members belonging to that peoples, to that group, to that corporate person of all those uh, of us here forming the symposium and those who right now are participating at the other side of their computers. If we have the full conviction about the fact that 
God loves and guides his peoples and that these are with through the Holy Ghost acting in diversity and receiving all this in a plural form, then we can indeed think of the spiritual exercises as something that is useful and good for the corporate subject. The corporate persona or person in the exercises receives that action of the Holy Ghost in its identity. Yes, this way better? Okay. So in, as I say, the corporate persona in the exercises receives the action of the Holy Ghost in identity, calls and answers. When each one of us start uh, eight days of exercises, we ask ourselves, what are we looking to do during these eight days? Do we want to discern something? Do we want to feel our pulse regarding God? Well, the same thing happens with a group. The group also questions identity and asks about its nature and also thinks about the calls and the answers to those calls and quests. The difference lies simply in that instead of it being one single quest, one single person wondering, it's many. But we have experiences of this in the church already. And we have experience of this in our tradition, because in the same way as the body is one with many members and limbs, but all the members of the body are one single one in the same way Christ, because this basic conviction of us being the body of Christ. We are a movement, we are moved by the Holy Ghost. And this can follow perfectly well then the dynamics of the spiritual exercises. So then the spiritual exercises and discernment and accompaniment. Well, yes, can we carry out spiritual exercises as a group? Yes. Can we have discernment as a group? Yes. But there is this accompaniment as a group as well. What I have learned in, in this association to which I belong is that mm, this common group discernment is accompanied mm, as a group. And it's better to have facilitators, a group of facilitators. It's not so much the director, but rather a group, a team of persons accompanying who are facilitators and have their own dynamics of, of uh, prayer, spiritual conversation, in order to continue to accompany the group in the best way possible without focusing in, in what one person might see or another is not seeing. So then the discernment is common and, and a group discernment. That's why it's so important to create a group. And about this historical overview I mentioned, and as, as we have them, I'd like to talk about the um, uh, Rambla and Lozano publication. We have them there to follow historically all the texts. This is the best thing that's been written, really. It's, it's um, a gathering that I would really recommend you to read. What I'm going to um, mention and this is a recent historical journey. Simply, if you have a look at the bottom part, those would be the general congregations and the letters and documents of the general fathers about uh, common discernment. So in the general congregation 32, and we mentioned it before about the possibility of sin as social sin, structural as structures of sin, well then everything that is um, establishing a common discernment. And so then common exercises also gained greater meaning. And if you see in the upper part of the figures on, on the timeline, you see um, two associations that come up, which are those that in fact uh, mobilize all this in the north of the US and Canada and later on in Europe. In the United States in the 70s, we see the birth of the Ignatian spiritual exercises for the corporate person, which is a group of Jesuits and lay people and also religious people who start to want to convey to groups the experience of the spiritual exercises and they gather and work on a manual using the book of the spiritual exercises, but 
led or taken to specific exercises that the group can do. And they publish a number of booklets, one of these focusing group energies. And later on, Jesuits who had trained in Toronto and who had retained that experience of um, working with ISEP brought this to Europe, especially to the um, South Belgium province. Um, Michel Bach, who's the specialist, Franciana as well, who's over there, was also one of the number. So I'm one of the newcomers, we might say. Yes, one of the newcomers. If you want to know more, if you want to know more, ask Frank or other members. And Esdak um, in 2006 published the practice of common discernment. Esdak means spiritual exercises for the apostolic discernment in common. And this is a group of about 60 people right now distributed among Europe, some in America, some in Africa, and especially in Europe, it's between France, Belgium, and some in Italy. And this group is DAC. Mm, facilitates or offers discernment of spiritual exercises for groups. It might be groups of nine to 10 people up to groups like the one I'll be telling you about later on of 250 people. So as you can see in this timeline, Parker, the publications we see are here and here and here. And I would like to highlight this last one, which is the one that unites all these experiences. So on the one hand, these are compendia of experiences and also guidebooks or manuals to accompany the experiences, which would be the methodological um, essence or steps of all this. Well, first and foremost, to discover the vital moment of the group, and to distinguish when the exercises are done, if uh, we are in a moment in which we can look for a more situation type discernment that is about our identity and uh, ask ourselves about the calls that we may have, or is the group maybe rather in a moment of uh, choosing of choice and election. So then time of change, and then uh, a decision has to be made, an apostolic decision has to be made. So in the same way as the person who goes for eight days exercises a year and the person starts by wondering, why am I here? What is it I want to find in these exercises? Well, in the same exact way, the group will have to ask, like the disciples at the beginning of St. John's Gospel. So what are you searching? What are you looking for? And on the basis of this, start with the different possibilities. From this, I go on to what I was telling you about, these frequently asked questions, how to adapt from what is individual to what is for the group. What are the main tools? How to identify the spiritual motions in a group? Is it possible to have um, Ignatian indifference in a group? Are there different levels of consensus amongst the group? Is it possible to go on from the I to the us when we talk about exercises, discernment and apostolic planning, and then the concrete specific experience of Buenos Aires I want to tell you about. How to adapt a group to the itinerary of the exercises. This has a lot to do with the way in which a group starts. And it starts with the initial questions when a group comes close to a team of facilitators. And one has to know very well what the group is looking for, the type of questions that they are posing. Because each person in the group might, might ask the questions of the dialogue of the Misericor, or the colloquium. But a person can also ask at a group level, what did we do for Christ? What are we doing for Christ? What will we do for Christ? And how the focus changes when I want to give a personal answer or when I think this as a group. Think of the groups in which you will participate. A group of teachers at the Granada University, for example, group of the mm, council, board of a school, a group of Jesuits 
working on youth pastoral a group. Think of all the groups that you belong to and those in which you participate. What groups would you see as possible to live together and experience of spiritual exercises? And what groups do you think it would be more difficult to, to go to this? I'll, I'll go into it later on. But it's very important as well to know how we can really and truly face God as a group. So then the idea is to, to take that group a longer process that includes uh, looking at its own history to celebrate misericord, to listen the calls, select the means to respond, to answer, and then confirm choices that have been done. So that means spiritual exercises for a group. First question then, there are groups that have to ask about their own identity. Who are we? Who are we before God? And there we would have exercises about what, which is our principle and foundation. How do we revere and serve as a group? Which is our radical vocation? How are we endowed and what are the talents for the world? Who are we? So it's an identity question. Then another possible question, and uh, that's a lot of the first week of the exercises. Yes, another possible question, enlarging the framework would be, what have we been called for by God as a group? What is that that distinguishes us, that gives us uh, strength, that the grace that God has given us as a group? And we're talking about the call, the mission of the group the goals to attain the development of talents and charismas. And here we would be talking about how you have an incarnation of that uh, saving of God through the group. It would be more the second week of the spiritual exercise, that question about what. But as well, of course, there's the, the question of how. How do we respond to that call? And here's when things become a bit confused, especially when we talk about the means, right? Because here it's not only how do we feel uh, regarding God, but rather, uh, you know, do we institutionalize or not? What planning, what resources do we have with what people? This question about how leads to other questions. What with, who with, when, where? Who's going to pay for this? Uh, can you pray to God as a group? Yes. But here you have to count on that there might be failures. Human means and divine means are not the same. And sometimes divinity hides. And there are times when we make, we, we make divinity be hidden, yes, as a group. So these would be now third and fourth weeks of the spiritual exercises because you first a life and death and resurrection. And it is uh, this, uh, what's, you know, the Christian ministry in its full force lived as a group. And what the group wanted from the beginning is, Lord, what do you want from us? And to accompany this experience, of course, it's the group that has to to, to follow the steps, those of us accompanying are the ones in the center, simply accompanying and giving every help to continue forward. This I'll be very quick about, but it's uh, quite interesting maybe to, to stop here. Every group has a process, birth, life and death. I mean, a group is born, it has energy, it grows. The group knows full well what it is. It has its own identity, what it is there for, what the call is, how to develop the call, to think about the beginning of any group in which you might have participated. Yeah, yeah, when you when we created that parish and we did that group to study whatever, when we created this fantastic NGO, well, think of all that moment of this energy of birth and growth, yeah, you experience life in fullness, and then, well, as we know, uh, you know, the identity confirms, it confirms the call and leads us all to action as a group. However, reality is also working in that it gives us recommendations coming from the relation, making us... Uh, well, decide and, and follow action and not always does that help us, that assessment helps us or rather the contrary, sometimes we think that we are losing that initial energy and the group flags because it cannot answer 
to the how, to the calls and questions the calls. And then in the assessment, well, it is seen that those calls cannot be met in the current situation. And the group even questions its own identity. And then the group loses energy and some groups eventually die. Have you been in any group that died? Any group that disappeared? I remember the last nun of a congregation. She was happy, but happy because she knew where she was and she knew where she had been. And she didn't live it as though that were the terrible, horrible death of no future. She lived it as a resurrection of the spirit in, in the church that will continue. I remember. So in these processes, the group has to know exactly where it is in order to focus on, on who it is or what it has to do or how to respond. Each one of these three questions has its own spiritual exercises. And I'm not going to go in them because it would take much longer and it will be in the final text. Where I'm going to focus now is which are the main tools for these, spirit, these group spiritual exercises? Well, as you might understand, it's a personal praying because you need that too. Then spiritual conversation as well and the plenary meeting. If we follow these steps of, of points for praying, personal praying, but you know, it's not only let's let's pray and then let's talk about what we have to talk and then yeah, all very nice, a PowerPoint, some music, five minutes to pray, and that that's it. No, 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 no way, no way. Let's change the order. Let's let's pray for an hour, a full hour before we talk. And when we talk, let's talk in an ordered manner because any every person in the group has something to say because the spirit, the Holy Ghost is with all. And let's have three rounds to listen to each other. One in which every person talks for five minutes. Another in which we don't repeat, but reply to what each person has said. And a third one with a colloquium with the Lord and what to mention what moved our hearts. I can't give more detail about uh, the main tool, but it is, of course, spiritual conversation. And here, Yes, we can deem that spiritual conversation is many things, but we have to really have it very clear what the rules are. I won't talk about the three rounds and what have you. I've said it already in a summarized version. But to give you an example, as you see, uh, SDAC has in its logo a feather. And of course, as it comes from the spiritual exercises that were done as a group in the north of Canada, of the original peoples there, they had this, um, well, who had the eagle's feather in the group in his hand was the person that had the spirit to talk and to be listened to by the others. And then in the spiritual conversation of the group in Isdak, they leave the feather in the center of the group and the person taking the feather has the right to speak and the right to be listened to. And that's right, the, this exercise is done of the feather, yes. And it really, well, it also means to go to the cultural roots of every place, yeah, in Buenos Aires, when we had, well, we, we had our group exercises, we had the mate uh, pumpkin in our hands, yes, and that's what we use today with the microphones, maybe it seems to be the same thing really as a feather or a pumpkin, do whatever, but listen, listen, that's what's most important. As I said, this all this is in sdac.net in the website, you can find that too. But what's most important is to listen to the spirit who is speaking in the whole group. In a group, there are emotions as well. There are motions, sorry. In the same way as this happens, there are my own as a person and those that come from the good and bad spirit and there are motions in the group and these come from within the group. Some are more positive, some are more negative. And here, the experts say that one has to know some 
psychological or social psychology and evolutionary psychology. You have to use the help of other sciences, yes, and to take the psychological and sociological approaches because we are not alone and we need the help of these other sciences to know what are the feelings of a group as such and not to want to just uh, say that something has a spiritual stamp when in fact it is something normal happening in a group. I remember in Buenos Aires, there was already always someone saying, in my country, we do things this different way. Well, listen, this is the method we have. Then other people would say, oh yes, uh, I've traveled 14,000 miles to come here for a retreat. Well, yes, this is the methodology. Yes, you always get that kind of noise, always. And what one has to do is transform such noise into harmony and make sure that we can hear what is beyond the noise or simply the hurry, the rush to obtain results. We could talk at length on this. There might be desolation and consolation in a group. When we talk about desolation, well, it would be all this tendency for the group that you see in, in the darkness, there's a lack of love, peace, service. The group has lost its energy. And well, we should apply the same rules that we apply in individual discernment, really. Not, not to go against and move and not this agere contra, it's, you know, also have time to pray. Or I am a person that simply disconnects and starts seeing emails in my cell phone when it's time to pray, things like that. Yes, in the same way as it happens personally, it happens as a group. And there are also consolations in a group. Yes, I mean, one has to be thankful for what yes is working and one has to assess and examine and value in order not to be deceived. The group might find itself in different moments. A group might be like the disciples at different moments and Pentecostal times and then it, the group might be as well like uh, the Emma, the mouse disciples that had to go from the sadness of the cross to the happiness of resurrection. But the group might be living time, such as the third moment, yes, uh, in the Jerusalem Concilium, where one has to stop and reflect and analyze and see where God is calling us to go. Well, in the same way as we react and we decide and we choose and we have times and modes, personally, the same thing happens with groups. And is it possible to have indifference in a group? Well, the first thing that one should say is that Ignatius never talks about indifference as a singular noun, but rather what he says is it is necessary to become indifferent. Yes, as a verb, an action verb, to become indifferent. Okay, so the group as well can become indifferent. It is really, well, to let itself be moved by the main tool, which as we saw is spiritual conversation. Within a group, you have different relations and conditioning factors. It's not the same thing for me to pay you a salary, but maybe I'm married to your sister. And furthermore, I don't know, you won the lottery, I've not, whatever. There are so many relationships going on and they're going to be in a group and they're going to make it more difficult for the group. And the only way to, to get through this is to pray, pray, pray and have spiritual conversation and this slowly and gradually is going to make or transform those existing relations they're not the elephant in the room yeah not at all one has to acknowledge them but they can be assumed and then one can look together for consensus and what is this consensus well consensus is different from unanimity consensus in a group is one united feeling and it's different from unanimity, which is one single voice. They all felt the same thing. It doesn't mean that they all said the same thing. And looking for consensus means to look for the route in which our hearts are all together and can move us towards doing things. And it is not the idea of looking for a majority, but rather to look where the hearts coincide. And there were many levels of consensus. The most, the deepest is the what the one of identity. We are united as followers of Christ. We are united as 
Ignatian spirituality is uniting us. Yes, it's the, the very bottom of our identity, but then there's another level of consensus to what we are called. Yes, we are here in spiritual exercises. Let's talk about God and then how we answer. It's another level of consensus. Yes, from this, we are going to go in this way. And these moments then make a group grow. And now there's, there's not much time left. Just let me tell you that it's a step through discernment going from the I to the us and through apostolic planning going back to the I, but I won't go into this, but just let me tell you that this is possible. It's possible to have spiritual exercises with a small group like this when you see 210 delegates from 73 countries and we divided them into 30 small groups. We spoke three languages. We facilitated three of us. Each one of us spoke a second language, not the first. And well, this went on for 10 days, the whole assembly and five, uh, 4.5 uh, common discernment. And what we tried to look for was what was the grace Yes, the grace that God wanted for CVX then. And we also wanted to strengthen the common discernment ability and the main dynamics. Well, you can have many. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about ESTAC, which is one way. Obviously, there are many others that might be better or worse. This doesn't want to be the best or the only one, not at all. Some of the exercises that we worked on, well, like Frank, Frank tomorrow will be talking about another exercise of group uh, spiritual exercises. So I'll let Frank give you more detail. All I'd like to say is that when you have such a large group, you also need uh, the plenary moments with large images. You have to really use the imagination, fill up the room. It was impressive. The moment at the beginning, the room was, imagine, uh, like a big tent with tables and chairs. So it were a United Nations meeting with all the flags and the music of La Compasita. It's a beautiful Uruguayan tango. And we asked people simply to take the tables out and move the chairs and to create circles with the chairs, but out with handbags, papers, computers, please, for every person to go along, just him or her. And this created this, well, here, for example, the exercise of writing the, the names of God and everyone seeing how each one had given a name to God in his or her life. I remember this old Japanese fellow that came with his paper, Oxygen. Well, listen, these things just happen in groups. And at the end of the day, they discovered that this is what they wanted to do. And well, this has continued three years later. It still, it still fills CVX with life. And just let me end by saying that what I see is that God still, still works with us. Thank you. Thank you very much.